everyone out this morning and trust that God's worked in your life and this week and blessed you in a very special way. Um, and uh, you're free and healthy, uh, free of COVID and healthy and well. Uh, do pray for Dennis Hagler's daughter and son-in-law, Tracy and Brittany Martin. Uh, they got uh, COVID and Tracy especially is having a difficult time uh, breathing and struggling through that. So pray uh, when you think about it. Uh, pray for Brother Dennis's family. He has not seen them for over a month, so you don't have to be afraid of shaking Brother Dennis's hand. Uh, they, they've gotten this um, well uh, past the last time he saw them, so uh, Brother Dennis is okay. Uh, but do pray for his daughter and son-in-law, if you will. Uh, Acts chapter number 20. I want to uh, try to help a pastor as, as much as I can through the transition here, and, and that's really uh, the The purpose of this message today is just to encourage you and strengthen you uh, uh, with the truths from God's Word concerning a pastor, uh, his responsibility to the church, and then the church's responsibility to the pastor. And so this this helps us uh, when we move into, uh, you know, a new season. It'll help us. Uh, Just good things to be reminded of. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Uh, It's in the Word of God. You've read it multiple times. Uh, I've preached on it along the way. And so it's nothing new, just a reminder uh, because of the stage in which we're in. Uh, If you've got your Bible open, chapter 20 of Acts, let's begin reading at verse 28. Before we do, though, let me give you a little background. The Apostle Paul is on his way uh, to Jerusalem. He's going to eventually find us find himself there, and he knows that once he gets there, he's probably going to end up uh, uh, in, in jail, and ultimately he, he knows that he's, uh, uh, or trusting in, in some way or the other, whether it's via the government or whether it's via, uh, uh, you know, personal decision, uh, to, to move westward with the gospel towards Rome. Uh, we know the end of the story. It's via the government. The government paid for that missionary journey and uh, uh, provided room and board for him uh, to preach there in Rome. So, but, but he knows these things are coming up, and he knows that he's probably not going to be passing through uh, this part of the world again. And he's done a, a good bit of, has spent a good bit of time ministering in this part uh, of Asia. And before he leaves and goes west, he wants to meet with folks again, specifically uh, the pastors uh, of the churches in Ephesus. And so he, he's gathered them together to him, and they're, they're uh, uh, just spending a little bit of time together. He, he's saying goodbye. But in the, in the process of saying goodbye, he's also exhorting them and admonishing them uh, to be faithful uh, pastors. And so he gives them basically their, uh, their assignment. He gives them their uh, job description, so to speak. And uh, this is what we find in the book of Acts chapter number 20. A, he details and lays out some of the responsibilities that these uh, shepherds, these pastors, these elders, uh, these bishops, uh, the Bible uses all of those words to speak of the same person, and uh, specifically not just the person but the office and the responsibilities concerning the office. And so that's what he's doing. He's just, he's, he's reminding them of their responsibilities. So let's look at that real quick. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. He says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. So he says, You, uh, pastors, you pay attention to yourself. You've got a job to do. Uh, he also told Timothy to do the same thing. He says, You know, take heed to yourself. Then you can take uh, care of the church. But, but pay attention to yourself that you don't get negligent in the responsibilities that God has given you. So he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Um, that word overseer would be, we would think of that as a manager. Uh, just one who uh, pays attention to the details and the affairs of the, the, um, the church. Uh, so that's what it means to be overseer. He just kind of, he, he has, he's supposed to know everything that's going on everywhere and with everybody and in all the ministry. So he, he alone bears that responsibility. So he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And so from that text, and we'll move down, uh, we'll look at the pastor's responsibility and then we'll move and look at the church's responsibility uh, to the pastor, and uh, we'll do that after we pray and ask God for his help. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the privilege to serve you. Thank you for letting us be a part of the church of the living God. 
uh, Church of Jesus Christ, the Body of Christ, and the called out assembly. Uh, Lord, uh, the representatives of Christ, ambassadors of Christ on this earth, uh, the organism through which you have uh, ordained that the gospel go forth to the world through. Uh, Father, this is your plan, and we thank you for letting us be a part of it. And uh, Lord, today, uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear the truths that are communicated in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, first of all, we realize uh, immediately that who does the pastor work for? Did you see that in there? He works for God. He doesn't work for the church, he works for God. And that's, that's really important to understand uh, when you think about a pastor. Um, the pastor uh, has been moved by the Holy Spirit of God to accept a burden and a responsibility that has been given to him by God. So he answers to God for how he carries that out, out that burden and that responsibility. Uh, he, he makes that very clear, doesn't he? He says, to uh, take heed to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. We've got to understand that real quick. When Paul and, and, uh, was called out to be a, uh, a missionary and to leave the church uh, there at Antioch, um, who was it that called him out? To, to be that missionary. The Holy Ghost did. That he put, they put, put a special burden in their heart, a desire in their heart. But who was it that acknowledged that call and um, supported that call? It was the church. The church sent them out. And it's the same with a pastor. Uh, God has to put that call. God has to put a burden. You can't make somebody be a pastor. Now you can pay them enough to entice them to take the job, but it's just a job. You can't make somebody have a burden and a desire, and, and, and feel the responsibility to answer to God for what they do. A lot of folks will, will take a, a pastor as a job, will take a pastor for a paycheck, will take a pastor for a vocation, um, but uh, that's not what it is. You don't want that. That's a hireling. You want a man who, who has a, a burden that's been put on him by the Holy Ghost, and you can confirm that and affirm that burden and encourage that burden. Uh, but first of all, realize uh, it's the Holy Ghost that has put that burden and that responsibility upon that man. So in light of that, what is the pastor to do? Well, first of all, he says there, feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The church belongs to God, not the pastor. Now, that's important to remember too, isn't it? Uh, from the pastor's perspective, this is not... Uh, any man's church. This is Christ's church. It's God's church. God bought the church. It belongs to him. And he has just uh, ordained that one would oversee that church uh, on this earth. Um, so he says there, uh, the first responsibility is to feed the church of God. What does that mean, to feed the church of God? Well, uh, we feast on the word of life. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is a living word. And the, this book right here is the written word. This is the bread of life. So uh, this is the, the, the bread that uh, gives us uh, what we need. Man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus said, when he was being tempted by the devil, but by what? Every word which proceedeth from the mouth of the Father. And we know these are the words of God. Uh, and so when he says feed the sheep, when he's not talking about go out and buy food and distribute it. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, what he's talking about is preach the word. That's what he means. That's what he told Timothy uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Look over there with me real quick. Again, here was a, a, a pastor that was being exhorted uh, to walk in the, uh, by faith in the Word of God. And he was reminded that one of his main responsibilities uh, was to preach the Word. So 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 2, uh, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, he says, Do this, preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. That means be ready all the time when it's convenient, when it's not convenient, when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. Uh, be ready to preach the word. And uh, preaching the word does a number of things. It reproves, it rebukes, it exhorts uh, with all long suffering and doctrine. So preach the word. Uh, one of the qualifications of a pastor is that he is apt to teach. That's to declare and make simple the truths of God's word, help them to be easily understood. So, first of all, he has a priority to feed the sheep. Uh, secondly, he has a priority to do this, uh, protect the flock that belongs to God. You say, protect the flock? How would a pastor protect me? I can, I can take care of myself. I'm bigger than the pastor. I don't need him to help me. Hey, 
uh, most of most of the case, uh, most of the time, you don't need uh, physical protection uh, necessarily. But we're talking about a spiritual protection. Uh, you, look at Acts chapter twenty. Let's, let's read there, verse number twenty-nine. So he has to feed the sheep. He has to protect. Uh, he has to preach the word of God. Uh, that's a main responsibility. Uh, he can't delegate that out to others. He can invite others in and he can train others up in that responsibility. But he can't sit back and let somebody else do that. He has to be uh, responsible for all that. Uh, not only to feed the sheep, to preach the word of God, but also to protect the flock. Um, he says this, for I know this, verse 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now are wolves sheep. They're not. But in order to get in amongst the sheep, uh, we learned this from Looney Tunes, what do they do? They, they put on a, a sheep's clothing, right? So they could sneak in. Well, the pastor is like Sam. Y'all remember Sam? Uh, the sheep dog, you know, he, could, he had to <laughs> pull his hair away from his eyes. Sam always won. And, um, uh, and there's a reason uh, for a shepherd uh, the reason for the shepherd is to protect the flock. One, from outside influences that would uh, come in and do damage to the flock. Uh, I was speaking yesterday to someone who, uh, who said that their church, a great deal of disruption was caused in their church uh, when someone came, joined the church, and it was found out in just, uh, just a, a short little while that they had, um, uh, they had white supremacists leanings. And that person came into the church and they began to, to try to uh, share their doctrine and share their uh, faith, to share what they believed uh, that, that um, uh, concerning other ethnic backgrounds and how they were less than human and how they, they needed to be eradicated. And um, at, at the beginning, this looked like a bright, shining, crystal testimony of, of uh, one who would be uh, a Christian and, and a, a faithful example. But in just a little while, those, those deviant uh, doctrines began to, to show themselves. And I guess who had to deal with that? The pastor had to deal with that. You know why? Because the church folk came up to the pastor and said, Preacher, you've got to do something about this. <laughs> uh, this is in here, and we don't like it. This is not, this is not feeling good to us. We don't, we don't agree with this. And Preacher, you've got to do something with this. Well, uh, were they right in saying that? They absolutely were, because that's one of the responsibilities of the pastor, is to uh, protect the flock that belongs to God from wolves who would try to sneak in and disrupt and destroy and take advantage of the truth uh, that God has revealed to us. He says, I know this, that after my departing, my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Hey, let me ask you this. Um, so the Apostle Paul departed, a few years went by, these fellows in Ephesus took note of what the Apostle Paul said, they, they did their best to protect their uh, churches from uh, outside influences that would destroy the churches. Um, is it all done now? Over with? They took care of that? No, it's still going on today, isn't it? And um, uh, so you, you, you want a pastor who's going to be faithful to that responsibility to protect the church from influences from without that would do damage, but not, also, not only to protect the church from influences without that would do damage, but also from influences from within that would do damage. Notice what he said in verse number 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And uh, what happens is, uh, you know, Sometimes we, we, can, um, we can get caught up in uh, a false understanding of God's Word and draw men to that with us. Nobody ever wants to be alone in anything. Uh, sometimes we can drift off into sin and make, uh, you know, just make exceptions for our sin and try to rewrite God's Word so that we don't feel so bad and don't look so bad. And we want others to join us with that. And that's what happens along the way. That just, that just happens naturally. So uh, like a good shepherd, uh, the pastor is to protect the church. Uh, Titus chapter 1, verse number 10. Notice what uh, God, uh, through the Apostle Paul, told Titus. This is another young uh, pastor coming up uh, who would uh, essentially uh, be a replacement for the Apostle Paul and his ministry. 
And uh, the, Titus was, uh, was uh, right up front. Paul said, listen, there's, got, there's something you've got to be aware of. It's going to be a, a responsibility that is yours. It's not going to be comfortable, but you've got to do it. Uh, you've got to protect the church. Verse number 10 of Titus, he says, For there are many unruler and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be, what's the next word? Stopped. <laughs> so as a pastor's uncomfortable responsibility to go and stop uh, people from running their mouths. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not a comfortable thing to do. But it's an it's essential thing uh, for a pastor to do. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Uh, wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. So go out there and do what? Stop the influence and protect the church uh, from the harm and danger that would come from it. Number one, Preach the word, feed the flock. Number two, protect uh, the flock uh, from without and from within. Number three, preserve the unity of the church. Preserve the unity of the church. Um, look with me over in Ephesians chapter number four. Preserve the unity of the church. Sometimes, uh, I mean, we're just people, right? All of us are people. Churches are made up of human beings who uh, along the way get crossed up. It's just going to happen. It's part of life. And uh, we have something special, though, that the world doesn't have. We have the Holy Spirit of God. And we have the Word of God to help guide us and keep us together. And one of the, another tool, uh, along with the Holy Spirit of God, along with the Word of God, is the pastor. Uh, his job is to help uh, preserve the unity of the church. Ephesians chapter 4, let's, we're going to read all the way down through verse number 12. Uh, so just think about this as we read it. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. So immediately we know he's talking about our conduct. He, he's talking about how the church ought to conduct itself. Uh, we ought to walk with all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. What's the purpose of putting up with each other? That's unity. Uh, we need to do that. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We know that's the way God wants us to live. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So now he's going to talk about how, so, how that we ought to walk in unity with one another. And then he's going to talk about how it is that this is accomplished. Uh, there are those who have been given um, gifts to help accomplish that a walk of unity. Uh, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, and he that he might fill all things. And he gave some, so he gave some churches, for the purpose of endeavoring to keep the unity in the Spirit, he gave some churches uh, apostles, now, we, we know that in our day, churches don't get apostles anymore. To be an apostle, you had to have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you had to have been endowed with the ability to do uh, miracles. The apostle Paul, uh, uh, Peter, John, those men uh, could do things that you and I cannot do and other men on this earth can't do. As soon as that, uh, the, the church was born... The, uh, the, the men who saw Christ face to face and who were called and commissioned by him face to face, when those men died, so did the office of an apostle. So some churches were started by an apostle. The church at Corinth and, and other churches were started by an apostle. So he gave those churches apostles. Um, it says, uh, but not everybody can have an apostle for a pastor, can they? <laughs> it, just, it just won't happen that way. There's only a handful of them, and they died, and that was it. Now, he says, uh, who, wh what are the others going to get? Well, some he gave prophets. Prophets. Now, in the, in the New Testament sense, 
There were prophets who heard from God and declared truth, uh, but most prophets were men who uh, continued to preach the truth that had already been declared. And so uh, some, some churches had uh, the gift of uh, prophetic voice uh, to lead them as a pastor. But some got apostles and some got prophets and some got evangelists. And I believe uh, that the evangelist here is our modern day missionary, someone who would preach the good news uh, to a place that has not heard it before. And uh, a church would be born and a, a brand new church that, that was not in existence before. And then they would be put together and commissioned and that, that evangelist would be a, um, he might then move on and start another church somewhere else. The Apostle Paul fulfilled that ministry and, and, and others did as well. Uh, uh, so so some, uh, some churches got a church planner to, to get them organized and get them together and get them started. Uh, a missionary, so to speak. Uh, but what do, uh, what, what do the rest get? What do most of the rest get? It says some pastors and teachers. Well, if a church has been around any length of time, if they outgrow their pastor or outlive their pastor or outlive their apostle or outlive their prophet or outlive their evangelist, they'll have to replace them, right? And uh, replace them most likely with a pastor and teacher. And most people agree that, uh, that pastors and teachers go together. Um, pastors having the responsibility of shepherding, teaching having the responsibility of uh, declaring uh, apt to declare the truth of God's word. So um, most men that serve and fill pulpits in our country, uh, apart from churches that are just brand new and getting started, most men are pastors and teachers. And uh, what did God give uh, these gifts to these men for? He gave the gifts to the men. He gave the men to the church. And what, is, what did he do that for? To, uh, to protect and preserve the unity of the church. You say, how do you know that? Well, look at verse number 12. He says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, say it with me, church, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So as a pastor's job is really to preserve the unity. Uh, you, there is not any way in the world that one man will agree 100% with everybody in here. That would mean that everybody in here would agree with each other 100%, and the man would agree, the pastor would agree 100%. But how likely is that to happen? <laughs> it's not likely to happen. Can you still have unity, though, in the midst of, of um, seeing life through a different lens? Yeah, absolutely, you can have unity. In the midst of that. And part of the pastor's responsibility is to take all the varying opinions and all the varying uh, likes and dislikes and pull them together into uh, something that everybody can live with and everybody enjoys and everybody can work with. And so uh, foundational to that is the unity upon the truth of God's word. And then uh, outside of that is unity on the practice of God's word. So he's, he's to preach the word, feed the sheep. He is to protect uh, he's to preserve the unity of the church. Uh, he is to provide an example. Provide an example. There are qualifications given for a pastor in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in the book of Titus. Let's look at the ones in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The qualifications that are given to a pastor aren't to identify super Christians. And it's not to set a pastor on a pedestal uh, that's higher than any other man. A pastor is just a man like any, everybody else. So the qualifications are not to put him on a pedestal so he's somebody special. Uh, it's not to um, identify a super Christian. That's not it. What are the qualifications for? Well, uh, it says in uh, sec, uh, 1, Timothy uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man don't know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Uh, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Uh, so, uh, why is it that God would give those qualifications? 
let me just give you my, my understanding of that. One, it's a protection for the church. It's a protection for the church. You want somebody that will, will speak well of the body. Someone who could reflect the church and, uh, and, and in the public eye protect the church. Um, you want that. But, but more than that even, number two is this. That he would provide for the church an example. A life whose faith, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 3, 13, verse 7, is worth following. You see, it's one thing if you say something, but you can't live it. That, that doesn't, you know, what we do is more important than what we say, right? Actions speak louder than words. Uh, so it's not just a matter of, of, of whether a man can preach the Word of God faithfully. It's really more important of whether he can live the Word of God faithfully. And why is it so important? Well, uh, it strengthens the message that he preaches, but it also provides hope to those he preaches to. You see, uh, the Word of God is a, a book that heals broken people, right? And broken people want help. And people whose hearts are filled with hopelessness want hope. And when they see the pastor in the pulpit, what they ought to see is a man who uh, has has gotten victory over sin in his life and who, who can walk by faith in the Word of God and a man who would give hope and who would inspire others to say, if he can do it, <laughs> so can I. Hey, if he can love his wife, I can love my wife. If he can train his children and discipline his children and, and raise up his children, I can do the same. If, if he can be honest in his affairs, I can be honest in my affairs. It just provides an example uh, for the church to follow. I believe that's very, very important, uh, especially because what we see in Hebrews 13, uh, verse number 7, are, are these exact specific words. If you want to look at that with me, uh, go ahead and turn over there. In verse number 7, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you. That's just another uh, word for oversight. Um, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Uh, so they, they've been given a responsibility by God. They have faithfully preached the Word of God, uh, but, but beyond that, they've also lived the Word of God, whose faith follow. See that? Uh, why did they live the Word of God? Why did they preach the Word of God? So that we can do the same. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. That word conversation doesn't mean what they say back and forth. It means what they do, how they live. It says, consider their life, if they've lived up to the Word of God and their decisions have been dictated by faith in the Word of God, hey, they are an example. They are, they're somebody that you can uh, emulate. They become a role model. What did Paul say uh, to others? He said, follow me as I follow Christ. You need a pastor who can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, it's very important that he not only preach the Word, protect uh, from dangers without and within, preserve the unity of the church, but also provide an example for others to follow. And then the last thing as far as uh, the pastor's responsibility is concerned, and this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, we'll have to end right here, is that he would be willing to get, present a report to God Almighty. He's got to be able to answer for all this. Um, look, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 17. says, Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. As they that must give account, give account to who? To God. He made them overseers, right? He put that burden in their heart. He put that call in their life. He, he put that desire in their heart. Uh, they, that desire was confirmed by a church. And uh, then he begins to exercise the, that responsibility. And one day he's going to stand before God and give an account uh, for how he watched for and cared for and fed and protected and preserved all these things. Uh, he's going to have to give an account to the Lord that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So who does the pastor uh, work for? He works for God. What are his responsibilities? To preach, to protect, to preserve, provide, and present a report at the end of the day. Uh, that's a high calling calling, isn't it? Um, please understand, the pastor, uh, a lot of the decisions he'll make in the days to come um, are dictated by by the fact that one day he'll stand before God uh, for the way he led the church. Um, and he has, to, he has to be able to fear God more than he fears man. 
And that's the pastor's responsibility. You say, preacher, what's the church's responsibility to the pastor? Well, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, first of all, provide just for the physical needs. If, if you want somebody dedicated and devoted uh, to, to, to doing the work that God called them to do, uh, make it uh, uh, possible for them to do that work. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 18. It says here, The scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. What happens if, if you're plowing with an ox and you don't feed him? How long will you plow? <laughs> not long. How long will your tractor run without gas? <laughs> it's just not going to happen, is it? There's a work to be done. In order to get the work done, you've got to provide for that work to be done. So he says, uh, uh, The scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Uh, and the labor is worthy of his re reward. So uh, that's just a simple little fact that teaches us that uh, uh, there is a work this, that, that a man does, and, and he ought to be remunerated for that work. Uh, it's not a wrong thing to, to pay the pastor, to provide for the pastor. As a matter of fact, it's a responsibility of the church. Uh, look over Galatians chapter number 6. And uh, my, most of the time when we look at this portion of Scripture, Galatians chapter 6, we look at it, from a different perspective. And it's not wrong to look at it from that perspective, but I want you to look at it in the context that it was given to us. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 6 says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Uh, communicate means to give. Uh, so if, if you've been given the word, give back. Uh, that which is necessary for that man to, to preach and teach and, and give us life to that word. Uh, now look at the promises that are connected to that, to verse number 6. Look at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So the idea is, whatever you invest in, that's what you will yield a return on. You won't yield a return on anything you didn't invest in. So if, if you're not, a lot of folks say, well, I, I'm just not getting anything out of church. Well, you might not be giving anything, putting anything into church. And, and that, that's, a, that's a notion there that we need to, to take note of. Uh, look at verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So those are connected to verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So first of all, provide for the physical needs of the pastor. It's kind of a, a simple little thing, uh, but it's a no-brainer. Uh, number two, follow the faithful example of the pastor. We, we saw this over in Hebrews 13, verse 7. He says, Remember them which have the rule over you, uh, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith, what's the next word? Follow. That's not, an, that's not a suggestion, is it? God says, if they have a faith that's worth following, follow it. If their life is, is built on the Word of God, if they're living the truth of the Word of God, then you have an obligation to live that truth out as well. So don't be afraid to follow the faithful example God has set before you. Uh, do that. Uh, you'll encourage your pastor's heart. You know what, um, what was it that John said um, uh, over there in the book of 3 John? Um, or he says, I have no greater joy than to what? Hear that my children walk in truth. You know what strengthens a pastor's heart more than anything else? Is that when he preaches the word of God, when he lives the word of God, he sees that influence carry over into the lives of those who listen to and observe his life. And that brings a great deal of uh, encouragement and confidence and strength. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire, you know? Uh, when, when, when God's people are responding to God's word in a faith that is an example, it just it, it, it brings energy and excitement. So don't be afraid. Follow the faithful example of the man of God. Number three, honor him as God's man. Remember, who does he work for? Does he work for the church? In a sense, but not... Um, not really. The church affirms the call and encourages the call, but one day he's going to give an account to God. Uh, so he really works for God. Uh, so honor him then as God's man. Honor him as God's man. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 17 says, Let the elders that rule well, the, el the word elder is just another name for pastor, bishop, um, uh, you know, Preacher, whatever you want to call them. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, 
Uh, double honor, not just for what they do, but for the position they hold. Uh, you understand that, uh, yes, he's laboring. We ought to honor him for his labor. But he also is laboring for God Almighty. We need to honor him uh, as one who does that. Uh, so it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. Now, there are probably uh, places where it's more laborious uh, to... Um, uh, to stand on, uh, in the, on the word and in doctrine, especially in cultures where, that are less Christian than others. And I, my, my hat's off to missionaries who preach in foreign lands to people who don't know God and whose life has been uh, just saturated with uh, false teaching and false truths. And the missionaries there have to take the word of God and, and really unteach what folks have been taught all their life and then to reteach them the truths of God's word. That's laboring in doctrine and in the word. Uh, I, I, would, I would imagine it might be just a little simpler in, in a Christian culture. Uh, but regardless, he says, uh, let, the elders rule well that, uh, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Um, so provide for him honor as God's man, uh, not only in the remuneration, uh, and in the honor, but also look at verse number 19. Look at verse number 19. We have to be careful uh, concerning a pastor what we say in public and in private. And there's a reason for that. Verse number 19 says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. The idea is uh, uh, you don't want to be quick to condemn your pastor. Because he's God's man, he's fulfilling God's position, uh, we want to honor him, and we don't want to be quick to spread things that may not be true. Uh, one of the worst things you can do for your church is to speak ill of your pastor in the community in which he pastors. You, you absolutely negate, uh, literally, the influence of not just the pastor, but the entire congregation, the entire church. And so uh, he says, be careful about this. Uh, except there be two or three witnesses, um, then uh, be, be, be slow to cast an accusation. He didn't say don't do it. He just said don't be quick to do it. Uh, somebody comes up to you and say, you know what pastor did last week? I can't believe he did that. And then you go and say, you know what pastor did last week? I can't believe he did that. You spread something based on what one person said. So be careful. That, that's not a good way to pre, uh, preserve the unity of the church. It's not a good way to continue taking the gospel to the world. Hey, I'm not, not saying you'll always agree with him. You won't. And there'll be some things he does that you don't like. Uh, but keep it to yourself uh, until it becomes something that um, God says must be dealt with. So provide for the physical needs. Follow a faithful example. Honor as God's man. And also remember he is just a man. He is not God. He's God's man. He is a man. And in light of that, uh, he's not going to be perfect. Uh, but he, and, and he does not speak uh, uh, for God. Does that make sense? He speaks from God. There's a difference. God doesn't tell him something that, you, that he then tells you. No, he speaks from God. God's told you and me the same thing in this book. And there's nothing that I should ever say or any pastor should ever say that can't be verified and validated by this book right here. And so remember, he, he is God's man, but he is just a man. And he speaks not for God, but he speaks from God. Uh, he is bound by God's word. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, or Acts chapter 17. Let's go there first. And then hold your finger in 1 Timothy 5 and we'll come back there. Acts chapter number 17. Look at the church here. In, it's a church in a town called Berea. And look what they were commended for. They were commended for how they uh, received the messenger of God. They were commended for how they received the men of God. And, and this is how they did it. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 10. It says, the brethren immediately sent Paul, sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. So Paul and Silas had to leave town. They ended up getting, getting to Berea. And when they came to Berea, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, like they always did. They, they went and they began to, to mingle with uh, people of faith. And it says in verse 11, these, that's talking about the people in Berea, 
these Christians in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all, what's the next word? Readiness. So they, they were hungry for the word of God. They wanted preaching. They wanted teaching. They wanted somebody to open the word of God and explain it for them. Uh, they were excited about hearing the word of God. But notice what they did. It says uh, they, were, they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they did what? Searched the scriptures daily for what reason? Whether those things were so. You know what they did with their preaching? They said, oh, that was a good message, preacher. We enjoyed that. That was an encouragement. And they went home and they read their Bible and said, let's make sure he was preaching the truth. <laughs> and if he didn't, guess what they did when they came back? They said, now let me ask you a question. Can you explain that one more time for me? I didn't quite understand. Now, that's not a bad question to ask. Uh, any preacher with assault would be willing to be challenged or questioned with what he preaches. Now, he might not change his mind. He might explain and give reasons for, and you might say, well, you know what? I never saw it that way. I can understand that. I don't agree with you, but uh, it might be that, or it might be say, well, no, that's, just, it, <laughs> that's as plain as day. That doesn't say it like that. And, uh, and, and if that's the case, then uh, you can consider him to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. But, um, and that happens. We were warned that that would happen. So remember, he's just a man. And he's bound by God's word. And it's the church's responsibility to make sure he stays in his lane. Does that make sense? Uh, you say, well, uh, what, what, uh, what authority does the church have? The, the church has the authority of God to preserve his word. Uh, how is it that we, ha we have the word of God in our hand? You know who, who brought this to us? It wasn't pastors. It was Christians. It was churches. It was churches who stored away the word of God in their heart. And when somebody came along and began to preach or write or change it, the church rose up and said, no, uh -uh, that's not right. We can't accept that. That's, that's not the way it's been. And the church said, we're, we're, we can't have anything to do with that. We're going to stay true to God's word. That's the church's responsibility. And uh, so you can't, you can't ever, uh, you can't stand before God one day and say, well, I knew it wasn't true, but we liked him so much. <laughs> God's going to say, well, I gave you a responsibility. And you, you, you were bound by the word of God as much as he was bound by the word of God. Everybody's bound by the word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Go back over there. So what happens when, when, when someone is not faithful to the word of God? Does a church have a responsibility? Absolutely. Um, if he, if he uh, outright decides he doesn't want to live according to the truth of God's word or doesn't want to preach the truth of God's word, the church has a responsibility. Acts chapter number, I mean, 1 Timothy 5, verse 20. He says, them that sin. So there are two or three or more witnesses. So what do you do with that? Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. So uh, this pastor and his influence is going to lead others astray if you don't check him at the door. It says, for the sake of the church, the church has a responsibility to check the pastor. And uh, it says, uh, them that sin rebuke before all that others may also fear. Uh, in verse number 21, he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things, what's the next word? Without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So just like Everybody else is bound by the word of God. So are the pastors and the preachers and the teachers and, and anybody else that sits in the pew bound by the word of God. Don't just say, well, that's, that's uh, the preacher. We can't, we can't say anything uh, about the preacher. Well, uh, not, not that's not true or not verified, but uh, when it's true and when it's verified, you have a responsibility, an obligation. You say, why is it so important that the pastor observe and keep his responsibilities and why is it so important that the church uh, fulfill their responsibilities uh, first of all let me ask you this why is the church here and why did God give a pastor to the church for whose glory God's glory and the church become, becomes the uh, the vessel for the gospel to be uh, distributed to the world so really is it about the pastor is it about the church What's it about? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when a church comes together for anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, when a pastor fills a pulpit for any, any reason other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and something has, something's going to get twisted up, and it'll go haywire. But aren't you glad we have a God in heaven? We have a Holy Spirit in us, and we have a Bible to guide us. And God, um, whatever apprehensions you ta- have uh, about the future, and, and it is kind of um, unsettling calling a new pastor, whatever apprehensions you have, you have a Bible to give you courage and confidence and comfort along the way. You be faithful to God, God's man will be faithful to God, and God will be faithful to us all. Amen? Let's stand. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for the privilege to serve you. Thank you for the truth you've given us in your word. And thank you that we can walk with courage and we can walk with confidence in this gospel that we have. Lord, we don't have to hide it under a bushel. We can share it with boldness to a world that you've given us. Satan wants to, uh, he wants to get in the way of that. He wants to dim our light and uh, cause our salt to be unsavory. But Father, we know that by your grace and according to your plan and your principles, uh, there are practices that are, uh, can be employed uh, to keep the light shining brightly, keep the testimony clean and pure and clear, and to keep, um, uh, Lord, the gospel witness going forth. And Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, for your name's sake, would you continue to minister and bless and strengthen uh, our community through this church? We ask this in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Stacy's playing on the piano. If you say, Preacher, I'm so glad that God's given me a privilege to be a part of His church. And I realize that uh, it's not just a social arrangement. It's not just a group of people who like each other getting together on Sunday mornings. It's a lot bigger than that. It's not just a job for a man and a paycheck and, 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 and a vocation for a life. It's a lot bigger than that. And I'm glad that God's given me a part uh, of being uh, a member of the family of God on earth. And I want to do my part to be faithful to Him, to be faithful to His Word, to make sure the truth of the gospel is made clear in the days to come. The altar's open. You come. You come. Maybe you'd say, Preacher, I've got things in my life that really ought not be there, and they've become a hindrance to me enjoying the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. And I realize that I need to confess that as sin and and make that right. You come. God says if we'll confess, He'll forgive. And He'll restore fellowship and sweet communion. You come. The altar's open. Maybe that you say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not a part of the body of Christ. If I died now, I would not go to heaven. Hey, before you leave this place, would you see me this morning before you leave? And we'll just make sure we open the Word of God and give you the answers to life's questions that you have and help you to see that Christ is what life is all about. And you can trust Him. You can can rely on Him. And He will save you. He will forgive you. Amen and amen. Well, tonight, 5.30, let me encourage you to be back. And uh, the ladies, I think, Stacey said, they'll just do a, like, a little walk down Memories Lane. And, uh, of course, men will, will pray and make some um, arrangements for everything here uh, to be uh, taken care of in, in, the, um, in the few weeks that we'll have uh, carryover. And I look forward to, to being here with you on that. And I, I'm just excited about men being able to get down and pray together. And I, I, believe, I pray that this will be the first of a, a number of uh, times where the church, the men, will just get together and uh, pray fervently for the Lord's direction and for the Lord's will. Choir will sing next Sunday morning, so we'll practice Wednesday night after church. It'll take maybe 15 minutes, and uh, we'll, we're looking forward to that as well. So be back Wednesday night as well. Well, let's, just, uh, let's be dismissed. Brother Ron, would you pray for us?